Hello, and I'd like to give everyone a very warm welcome to this event, uh, Q&A with uh, Kadiatu Kanemason. Uh, this event is hosted by the Berwick Literary Festival and the Berwick Music Series. So let me introduce uh, Caddy uh, to you, to, 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 to many of us who have read the book, Caddy needs absolutely no introduction. But in case you're thinking you might read the book, um, just to maybe say a few words about uh, Caddy uh, to start with. So uh, first of all, um, Caddy is a former um, lecturer of English at the University of Birmingham. Uh, and her book, which we'll be discussing, The uh, House of Music, has, has won a number of awards. She herself has won awards for contributions to um, children's arts and is very active in the field of um, access for, uh, for all to music and classical music. Um, so very accomplished in her own right. Uh, and clearly um, uniquely placed in being the mother of and having raised uh, seven uh, phenomenal uh, children who have, some of whom are no longer children, but who are really at the, the top of their, their field. Uh, uh, and amongst these uh, these children, there are uh, number one UK classical hits. Uh, there's MBE uh, featuring in royal weddings, um, concerts uh, too too numerous to mention. Uh, very active in uh, in access for uh, for all to music. So a, a family of super high achievers, let's say, and even the the youngsters who are still at home already achieved their grade eight in several instruments at the age of 12 or 13. So this is an astonishing family. And I think one of the wonderful things about the time we have together is to just hear uh, Cathy's experience of raising such a, a unique family. But I think the other thing I would say in introduction for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, the book is also, it's not just an insight into this uh, unique family, um, but also tackles um, issues of, uh, of race discrimination, access to, to music, um, the pan what the pandemic has meant for, uh, for musicians. So a really wide range of, of topics, which I hope we can just get into and, uh, and discuss as, uh, over the next uh, hour. So Caddy, thank you for being here and, uh, and sharing your, your story with us through this book. Thank you, it's lovely to be here. I mean, the top question, of course, is, um, well, my first question would be, how on earth did you have time to write the book? But that sounds very technical. So maybe just to start with, what inspired you to, to write this book? Well, I'd go to concerts with the children. Um, one of the children would have played a concert. I, I call them children as well, even though I should say young people. And um, audience members would come up to me afterwards and say, what is the story behind all this? And um, a few of them started saying, well, why don't you write the story? And then my children joined in and said, why don't you write it? So I thought, well, maybe that's, there are so many questions that maybe I can tackle them all in, in, in a book. And, uh, and, and then how was that to do that? Because it's, it's really quite, um, it's, it, there's, a lot, there's a lot there. So how, how was the process of writing it? It was actually quite difficult at the beginning because I, I wrote a few sort of first draft chapters and then had to throw them away. And then I said to the children, number one, I don't have enough time. And number two, it's actually quite difficult to do. And one reason it was difficult is if you're still in the morass of family life and events, it's difficult to work out what the narrative is and sit down and remember. And the other reason was, but I realized I had to write about the background of everything. There was no point just saying what had happened to the children if people didn't understand who I was and who, what the, where the family came from. And that's actually more painful to write, I found. Say, say a bit more about that actually, for, because it really is a, a unique uh, background um, that you and, and Stuart have, but it, I think share a little bit about that and, and again, why it was, painful to write about? 
Yes, because I think the big question people asked me is where did the drive come from? Where did the determination come from? And I thought actually it came from my parents and it came from Stuart's parents and it came from the experiences we had as children. So I was born in Sierra Leone in West Africa and uh, my mother was Welsh, my father African. They met in the UK and had to go through a huge barrier to get together and stay together. So my mother is quite a determined woman and she, against everyone's wishes, got on a ship, um, went to West Africa and married my father after he'd gone back home. And that was a huge act of defiance, I think. But then my father died after they had four children and she brought us all to the UK. And I think that experience was incredibly formative, incredibly difficult, and probably says a lot about why I brought up the children to be very determined as well. And the same with my husband's family. His parents came from Antigua in the Caribbean in the 1950s and had to go through what was a very difficult time, I think, in the UK for um, black immigrants. So, yes, I think our strength definitely came from them. I, I mean, your your mother does sound like a really phenomenal character. I was always wondering if the, the sequel will be about her life and what, what shaped her, because indeed to make those decisions at that time were incredibly brave. And uh, uh, she sounds like a really fascinating person. Yes, and I wonder if I would have been that brave because it was a choice that was very difficult to make. She used to walk down the street. My father was here studying in Birmingham and that's how they met. And they used to walk down the street and be shouted at and abused, but she never wavered. And I used to say to her, how did you have that courage? And then to just get on the ship for nine days, go to a country that you didn't know anything about, never been to, and decide that's where you were going to start your married life. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. So yeah, I'm not nearly as strong as she is. <laughs> she said, she, well, I, I think you are, to be honest with you, because um, um, you do describe um, really in quite a, a, a pro profound way, the experience of, of coming to back to the UK um, and, and the, the you know what it was like as a as almost as an Im a migrant. So maybe if you wouldn't mind sharing about that, and then how it was to maybe looking back on it now, whether anything was it in cathartic to write about it in some way, or actually no, just just painful. Yes, I don't think cathartic is quite the right word. I think it, it, it's like facing your demons, which is just always hard. So I arrived, um, I was nearly five years old. I had um, an elder brother who was six and two younger siblings. And this was the 1970s, which uh, was not an easy time. And I remember being shocked because we would walk down the street and we'd get called names and we would get laughed at and shouted at and abused. And, and I just thought, what are they talking about? And then realised that they were talking about us and that we must be very strange. And I think learning to understand a new identity, I think, was very difficult. And then starting school and being the odd one out all the time. And, um, and I think I just wanted to be like everyone else. I just wanted to assimilate. I didn't want to be this alien from another planet. And that was incredibly hard. And I think I had to be incredibly tough to get through school and to do well and to make something out of that. Because if someone's telling you all the time that you're inferior and you're ugly and you shouldn't be here and you don't belong, I think you have to just fight your way through that. And it didn't stop in childhood either, right? So even as a, as a young professional in a, an environment one would think is is quite well educated. Once again, you know, you experienced a number of barriers. Yes, and I think it's that experience of not looking like you're supposed to. So there was an idea of what an English lecturer was meant to look like, and that wasn't me. So um, I remember going and I was the sub-dean of student affairs, and I had to go and support a student because he had been accused of plagiarizing. 
and he had a very English male name. And even so at this tribunal, I was suddenly being addressed as the student who had plagiarized. And, um, and I had to say, no, actually, I'm the sub-dean and this is the student. And I remember thinking it's, and I was never apologized to. And I think making a way as a professional as well um, can be very difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, one, one thing I did wonder about reading is that th these are experiences you speak very personally about, and it's clear in the, in, in the writing that full-blown race discrimination is at play in these instances. When you write about some of the things that happen to the children, um, I think it's, it's, it's a bit more... Is that, do you think that might have been a race issue? Like, for example, um, Sheku leaves his his cello um, on the on the Eurostar, has to get it back from. He doesn't leave it on the Eurostar; it's taken off him, but he has to retrieve it from lost and found, and it takes him hours to get the cello back, me, making him so late for the rehearsal that he went to Paris for that he almost might not have gone at all. Again, you just say it like that, but I, I think I was wondering, would a white cellist have had the same issues? And I think you also mentioned it in Isata's education that you, at, at one point, there's this, I, I just wondered, would a white child have had the same comments made about them? But maybe you could share a little bit as to whether you were, yeah, what you're, what, whether, am, I, am I seeing something I should, I, that doesn't exist? I think I very deliberately decided to present it as facts and then leave people to decide. And also, I think because it was my children's experience and I was always very careful when they grew up that um, they were entering. I knew they were entering a world where people would think they didn't belong and they didn't look like classical musicians or what people would see as classical musicians. And I didn't want to put on them all that had happened to me. Um, even though they were very aware of it and I was very aware of it. I thought it's up to them to decide and it's up to them to analyse and interpret. Um, of course, the reason he didn't get his cello back was because they didn't think he looked like a cellist and couldn't possibly own the cello. Um, but I think really so many things that happen with their generation is for their generation to interpret. So I think I would observe and then we would talk about it. But um, yes, I think I very deliberately left it like that. <laughs> and has their experience been different uh, to yours? I mean, has have things gotten any better? And I also wonder, even then after the, the killing of George Floyd, when which has raised a lot of consciousness in, in this country, has that also improved anything? Do you know, it's so funny, when that happened, um, I remember Stuart and I talking to the children and saying, well, we've reached another moment, but this is not the first moment. Um, and we said to them, yes, uh, people are, they want to make changes and they're suddenly focusing on all these things that we've always known. But the, the spotlight won't stay here. And it doesn't mean we're going to take 10 steps forward. Maybe we'll take half a step forward. Because I said, we went through, in 1993, we went through the Stephen Lawrence case. Um, we've been through so many other issues, so many other moments when suddenly we think things are going to change. So I think it's two steps forward, one step backwards. And, and I said, actually, what you have to remember is there is nothing new under the sun. And you have to make the most of this moment, do as much as you can, keep talking about it because it will suddenly get less easy again. That's uh, a bit, a, a bit uh, well, it's good advice, but it isn't it frustrating? Um, yes, and I think your question, has it got any better, is really difficult to answer because um, yes, of course, a lot of things have got better, but I think that it's never just a straight line of progress. And I think about what happened with all the Brexit debate when suddenly um, all those issues of racism started to come to the fore again. And I remember thinking, oh, no, we're going back again. 
Um, and I was hoping that we were going forwards. So it's very difficult for me to answer that question. I do hope it's getting better. Mm. And does the world of classical music, is that in a, in a way a, a more, uh, a, an easier environment or same as the rest of society essentially? I don't think you can separate it from the rest of society. What I do say though, is I think the classical music world wants audiences. They want um, their audiences to be diverse. They want people to love classical music. They want to welcome people in. They want diversities in their orchestras. So I don't think it's that it's not a welcoming world. I think there's a reality that the people who have access to becoming classical musicians is a very narrow group of people because it's expensive, because it's not accessible in state schools, all of those reasons. So I think the barriers come before you get to conservatoire or before you get to audition at orchestra. And then of course, you've got to overturn so many people's expectations, which have been set before that point. So um, I do think the world of classical music is trying as hard as it can. Um, but of course, there, there are so many barriers still to get through. Yeah, the, the um, access to music is a, is, a, is a really interesting topic. I mean, what work is underway within the country to really try to um, bring more attention to this? Because, um, uh, as you say, it, it's it, even whatever about the justice of giving access to all to music, the the joy, and it comes out of the, the book that you've read, the, the joy that comes from, from music and, the, and, and what it does to one's spirit, let's say, is so important for young people to experience. Yes, it's interesting because over the pandemic and the lockdown, people realised and, and expressed how important music was, how important that communication and self-expression was, how important all of these wonderful um, creative arts are, but yet it doesn't seem to get reflected in education. So as soon as schools opened again, there was this comment that we need to get rid of those and concentrate on maths. And I thought, Oh, but what about, so it's almost as though one thing is said one side, but then it's not acted on in the other hand. So um, I think that there is so much work going on in so many different places, um, both at the conservatoire and orchestra end and at the school end, but it doesn't seem to be coming from within the schools themselves or within the government. And I think there are so many amazing music charities who are working so hard to go into schools and give access to children. And they are raising money and they are um, raising consciousness. But um, it's, it's like bashing your head against a brick wall. And really, it shouldn't be coming from charities. It should be something that we all take responsibility for. So I think that's the next step. Yeah, but of course, I mean, your family do form a wonderful role model in that sense. I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot more kids now who are e expressing interest in doing this when they see um, what, what can be achieved. And uh, I guess, do, do, do they have a, a big fan base, the kids, with, with lots of, uh, sorry, I keep on calling them the young people. <laughs> Yes, and that, that's the most wonderful thing. I mean, the thing they love the most is if they play a concert, for example, and some little child will come up and say, I'm playing the cello because of you, or I've started playing the piano because of you. And we see it as well in the junior conservatoires. And um, when we talk to teachers, that they say there is, there's a huge groundswell of interest. And that is fantastic. And from people who wouldn't have ordinarily taken up those instruments. So I just hope it keeps going and I hope we can keep encouraging children because that's what's going to change everything. It's these young people coming up. Because Sheikha always says, it's fine I've gone through the door, but we've got to leave it open so that others can come through. So I do hope that's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the, the pandemic there. Um, I mean, uh, in, in the book, it, this is like a, I mean, you, you describe so brilliantly how kind of mad that, that sort of gradual descent into what is happening here. And then, you know, the craziness of having all of the family at home and all of a sudden, you know, I think a, a, a student friend there as well, uh, not that you had like loads of space. Um, but also they were just beginning their careers. So in performance, so that it must have been really um, qu 
quite disturbing the whole uh, the whole thing yes and i remember um suddenly we, we well in fact it it, it um, we were just about to get on a plane for antigua because they always go and encourage the children there and do concerts and um they're helping to build up the antigua and barbuda youth symphony orchestra and so we were literally two days um off getting on a plane and antigua shut down and before before britain did and we thought, oh, we're not going. So everybody came home. And so we were already home when lockdown was declared. And when it was declared, we were already ill as well and realised we all had COVID. Um, so, but I, we, none of us were worried about that. What we were worried about was the loss of the concerts and what was going to happen. And, you know, suddenly we couldn't play music. And, um, and I think all my grief, I wasn't feeling well, but... Um, I was more grief stricken with what's going to happen with these young people. And it wasn't just musicians, it was all young people. It was incredibly frightening, I think, for them. And, and what's, what's the current state of plagues? It's quite hard for some of these things to come back. And, and do you think it'll have had a longer term impact on the lives of these musicians? Yes, and uh, the children know so many young musicians who have given up. Um, partly because the work was no longer there and partly because of uh, psychologically and emotionally it was an incredibly difficult time to go through and so many of them have not recovered. Luckily um, with our family it's been fantastic, they've been able to get back to work and back to conservatoire and back to touring and concerts but it has not been easy and um, for example, my daughter, it was 2020, um, September 2020, she was due to start at the Royal College of Music, arrived there all excited and they locked down. And she literally spent the first term locked in her student room with an electric piano, which wasn't what she went to conservatoire for. And of course she wasn't alone, it happened to so many young people. And I think you don't get those years back, but what you do learn is resilience. And I think now they are so happy to be back playing and meeting people and sharing their music that um, I think that will, in fact, give them an impetus. Yeah. Um, I, 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 let's talk, if you don't mind, about the uh, about the the family and how was it? Is it complete chance that seven uniquely talented uh, children should befall you, or how much was kind of like? intentional almost that she was like you know um it, it shall be so let's say <laughs> no not at all um i think uh it kind of just happened almost with its own engine i think if you have children you can't suddenly say this is what they're going to be i'm going to make them all classical musicians because it doesn't happen like that so i think what it was it started with number one isata she really wanted to do music and was just taken up by it and the others all followed. But I think probably the unique thing is there were so many children all wanting to do the same thing, inspiring each other and playing together. I think that was it, actually. Wow, that's, uh, uh, that, that's really striking. Because, um, I mean, many of us who maybe have children who are learning musical instruments, it's, it's kind of like an awful lot of... I mean, obviously, innate talent is only sort of 20%. There's so much hard work and dedication required. And so, I mean, what what tips do you have for us to kind of, you know, create that kind of enthusiasm for, for practice? I think I use the same tips, well, the same um, methods for music as I did for having a big family. So I found routine was the only way to survive everything. Um, and so there was a, always a routine for their practice. And I think if children have routine, they sort of expect that that's what's going to happen and they just do it. They were also lucky that they had siblings who were also doing the same thing. So it wasn't as though they were isolated on their own. But what we were very careful to do is when they did practice, we gave them attention. So probably half an hour of attention each from room to room. And, um, and that was their special time. And we praised them a lot as well. And I think having that attention and that praise and um, that nurturing made a huge difference. And then of course they had each other. So 
um, it was probably in some ways harder, but in other ways easier to have a lot of them doing the same thing. I'm just trying to visualize half an hour each with seven children while you're trying to make dinner. I'm just, <laughs> I can't make the math work. Yeah, so it was, um, they'd come home from school, big pot of food, that was very important. They had to eat first, then they would do their homework, which would, they were very good at packing into quite small space. Um, and then it would be practice. And um, so they would all be practicing in different rooms, bathroom, bedroom, wherever. Um, if it was the piano, obviously they had to be where the piano was. And then I would just rotate and they would know exactly who was going to be next and what was expected of them. And that was the best and easiest way of doing it. Otherwise it's chaotic. <laughs> yeah, no, indeed. It's chaotic for me, I've only got two. So uh, that is, but also it just shows such, um, uh, yeah, incredible, you very organized yourself clearly to be able to then create that sense of, of routine for, for seven other children. Well, it does sound like that, but actually, <laughs> I don't think, I mean, I think um, I just went from hour to hour um, in a sort of exhausted fashion and got to the end of the day and thought, oh, and then, yeah, so it wasn't, I mean, I wasn't this wonderful, peaceful, um, organised person. I don't think it works quite like that. <laughs> well, there were some, there are some wonderful moments where you, you know, you describe this kind of incessant, you know, washing of clothes and, you know, get, having to get up at four in the morning and then getting stuck in rush hour traffic. And, you know, you, you definitely don't make it sound like it's easy for sure. <laughs> um, but I mean, I, I, I am interested in, you know, in, in your resilience, actually, because I think, um, you know, for many working working mothers or non-working mothers, uh, there's a, and, and fathers, actually, as well, the demands of, of life are only going up, it seems. Um, so how, and, and you know, you, you don't shy away from that at all, but say a little bit about how you kind of made it through and what, what would you do the same things again now looking back? Yeah, I think that's really important. I wanted to make sure that people didn't think that I was this wonderful earth mother who was just the perfect mother, because I think it's incredibly hard being a mother in so many different ways. And I think you have to accept that. I mean, I used to go to bed at night crying with guilt because I hadn't done enough or I wasn't a good enough mother and, and all of those things. So every day was definitely not perfect. It was ragged. It was a mess. But um I think I remembered my mother as a single mother bringing four of us up. And of course I had Stuart, he was at work a lot and back late, but he was there. And I thought, oh, it's, it's easier for me in that sense. I did have backup and they had their grandparents who would swoop in from London and Wales and, and help us. Um, and that was really important. So it was not, I was not isolated, but I think I just had this vision. I thought, well, they did it. Um, so I can do it. And I think it's when you've got that model before you as well. And also I thought they are going to have such a hard time. If they want to be classical musicians, it's hard. So if I don't back them, then how are they going to succeed in anything? Not even if they don't want to be classical musicians. So I think I had that very much in mind as well. Hmm. And actually that piece around that drive, there's one thing to drive to be good at your instrument, but then, and quite another to, I think, think, right, and I'm going to really, this will be my livelihood. And so, and maybe not all of them, yeah, just interested in in whether it was clear to the, the children from the very beginning that it, indeed it was going to become their livelihoods. Um, I think for us, we were very keen not to say, you know, you should be a classical musician. That's another step. We were keen to say, we want you to just do really well on your instruments and love music. Um, but I said to, at the age of, well, straight away, and at the age of nine, made it absolutely clear, so I am going to be a classical pianist, which I was worried about because I thought, is she setting herself a goal which is unachievable? So I said, if that's what you really want to be, you do know what you're gonna to have to do, and that's practice a lot and it's going to be hard but she never wavered, that's what she was going to be. And then her brother said the same thing. And I thought, okay, well, and I said, look, it's up to you, but this is what it means. You are going to have to practice. If you don't want to be musicians, that's fine. 
but they never wavered. It's, it's very interesting. Mm. Then we get to Conya, the middle child, and I think she was always a bit more ambiguous because she wanted to do writing, she wanted to do music, and I think having three older siblings who were so driven and set on that path, it was more difficult for her. So she did have moments of sort of saying, I'm not going to do that. But then she made her own decision and decided, yes, she was going to go to conservatoire and be a pianist. And then it carried on. So, but I don't think parents can ever tell their child what profession to have. That's a mistake and not mm -hmm. the but so, I mean, you talk about the, the benefit of them all being in the same world is the kind of, um, you know, it, it kind of creates this um, positive upward um, trajectory. Uh, but it could it could go the other way as well. Right. The, because they're all competing in the same same league, essentially. So it, do, does that create tensions within the family? No, that's interesting. They've never been competitive with each other. And um, and in fact, when people ask them that, they gen genuinely bemused because for them, I suppose they're different ages. So um, they always say, well, we're different ages, so how could we be in competition? Um, and also if one of them succeeds, they feel that they've all succeeded. So there's definitely a very strong family identity. So when Sheikh who won BBC Young Musician, for example, in 2016, they were all so excited because it meant it was great for all of them. So I think there's very much a sense of a kind of gang collective identity which is important um, and they're very competitive when it comes to board games or playing sport together or anything like that but never with music and in fact the older ones are much stricter than me on the younger ones they want them to do really well um, because I think they think it reflects on them so the competition is, is definitely not the right word no <laughs> There's a question has actually come in on the on the chat. Um, did you teach your kids to play the instruments or were there teachers who, who came in to do so? Yeah, so I started them off because I had grade seven piano as a child and I had grade five clarinet, um, but um, we went into strings. Well, in fact, Brian had played the clarinet at school for a bit. But um, so yeah, I started them off with music theory and piano. And um, I learned to play the violin as an adult, actually, um, got to grade five. But I found it was really important that they have external teachers. I don't think they can have just their parents. Um, and I, well, also, I was not a qualified teacher in any way, but it was, it was quite interesting. They needed to go and have an external teacher and then come back and I would supervise their practice. That's okay. But I think if it, if it had only been me or only my husband, that's quite, I think, entrapping for a child. And um, I don't know many parents who could teach their own children. I think you're less patient with your own children, actually. <laughs> Teachers yeah. are usually nicer. <laughs> so does Stuart have a musical background is another question that's come in. Yes. So he played up to grade six cello at school and grade eight piano. He was post grade eight piano but neither of us are musicians. So we didn't go on to conservatoire or anything like that. And I think we would have thought that that wasn't something we could do. And I don't think we were probably taught to a high enough level and we didn't have the same opportunities. So it was never something that came up as something we could do. No, indeed, you may, because um, at one point Stuart has this, there's a moment where he, he could have gone into a musical school, I think, or is it? And then, but indeed decided not to. So, but again, do you think that's also just a little bit that not, no role models and or understanding of what that world might offer? Exactly. So he was 10 or 11 and um, he was um, offered a place at a specialist music school. And he's, and he, you know, he didn't really understand and his, parents didn't understand and his first thought was does that mean I have to give up football and uh, his parents said I don't know and he said that's it <laughs> so he didn't go um, but it is it's it's lack of understanding <laughs> yeah well, there's a raft of questions now which is uh, which gives me the sense that uh, people are really now interested in the how to get their children playing so um did any of your children start learning their instrument at school or were they always taught privately? I uh, wanted to start them off at school, but then I realized that um, they could start the violin, for example, when they were in year five. 
And I thought that was too late because they were desperate to start already. Um, in terms, and so I started them all off myself and then got private teachers. And I also found that at school it was always group lessons and, and it meant that they were going at a much slower pace. So I had to also do private lessons as well. And, and what, what age did they start learning and then what age did they start getting lessons? So that varied. So the eldest, Isita started at the age of six. Actually, she started music theory and recorder before that, probably the age of four. Um, Brian was probably around five um, and Sheku around the same age. And then um, they're all about the same. And then Jennifer, at the age of three, decided she wanted to learn the piano and started learning the A minor scale. So I thought, oh, they can all start at three. So the next one, Aminata, I put her on the piano at age three and it was a disaster. <laughs> so she was not ready till she was five. So I think it kind of varies on the child as well. Yeah, and, and the, the children's schools, how supportive were they in, in their musical education? We were very careful about the schools we picked. So it had to be state schools because we couldn't afford private schools or anything like that. And there was a local primary school which with a really brilliant head teacher and he was really interested in music. We were just lucky with that. So he would play music as they walked into assembly. There was classical music playing. He had a band. He had music nights at the school. It was an incredibly musical school with huge amounts of support. And then with the secondary school, they went to Catholic secondary school and there was a fantastic head teacher there as well, who was absolutely passionate about music. So they were very lucky um, because that's not present in all, in all schools. So that was luck. And I think it was vital, actually. Say a little bit about what your observation around the, what music can do for young people. I think, well, I take the example of their schools. So um, they went to a secondary school where music was right at the centre of the curriculum. Every child was expected to learn recorder and violin when they arrived at the school. Um, they had a huge amount of praise for music. There were school concerts every term. Um, there was a prize giving with music. There was Christmas concerts. Everybody played. There were several orchestras. It was amazing for just a working class state comprehensive school. And, but then it meant they had really good academic results as well. And the children were really happy. It was a really happy school. And then when my, um, in fact, it was when Sheku was in the upper sixth, there was a change of head teacher. He did not like the music. He, de he decided to sack some of the music teachers. Um, he didn't think music was important. And within a year, um, the academic results went down and the school changed and became less happy. Um, it's got a bit better since because that head teacher has left and there's a head teacher who's more interested in music. But the problem is when you lose music teachers, you lose resources, very difficult to get them back again and the school went from outstanding to good in a matter of a couple of years so and and I think you can see it in children you can see when children are happy and they've got self-confidence and they're communicative and, and there's a school community and what music gives you all of that and it gives you confidence across the board as well yeah, I mean, just performing to to your pair to a group of parents, and I mean that for a, ch a child, who, it's it's a wonderful thing, isn't it, to get that kind of platform so early in life? Exactly, and I think it's so important. I think particularly since um, that's what COVID must have taught us: the amount of anxiety in children. But if you have music, um, you have a way of, and I and I, I mean, I'm always pushed to talking about all the touchy-feely things, which are really important, that psychology and happiness and joy and um, confidence. Um, but also it is an academic subject as well. And um, it's a very good subject for children to learn. It does have academic rigor. So it's all around, I think, really important. Yeah. Well, what's your assessment of the state of, say, musical education in... In, in the country? I mean, um, is it really down to individual head teachers or um, is yeah. there any kind of incentivization for schools to, to kind of pr pursue a programme like this? I think there's very little incentive for schools. 
Um, I think it is down to individual head teachers, but they are now facing further and further, worse and worse barriers. So they've got budget cuts um, and they've got parents who think that if they let their children do music, that somehow their children are going to lose out. So I think valuing music and the creative arts has gone out of the schools. And that's, um, and that's a problem. It's not the fault of the schools. It comes centrally. Um, parents are just not valuing the subject anymore. And I think about when I was at school, I went to a Welsh comprehensive school, uh, working class area. Most of the children were of steel working families, lots of music. It was all free. There was all an orchestra. I had free clarinet lessons, all of that. Now that's gone. So, and I think it's a tragedy actually. Yeah, agree. Um, well, the question, so uh, what about you? You're absolutely amazing. Do you teach English? You must be a great teacher. <laughs> Thank you. Well, actually, I was a, a university lecturer in English, but um, my career was sidelined by having too many children. <laughs> so, But I actually loved my job. And I think I just um, diverted and talked to the children about literature and poetry and music instead. And, um, and they actually love all the creative arts, which is wonderful. But um, it's just love of it. But uh, do maybe say then, because uh, you are involved in a, a number of things. Um, so maybe just say, well, because, you know, now that you've only got two children and one of them is 17, um, you know, because you're very active. So it'd be interesting to hear the contribution you are making. Well, I think I was so worried about uh, what happened with my children's school and so grateful to the schools for allowing, for helping my children actually to become musicians. Because I think if they hadn't have gone to a school which was so lively and so supportive, they would not have had the confidence to become musicians. Because just um, as black children going into the school with violins and cellos on your back, you can't do that in a lot of schools. Um, but you could in that school and still be cool and still play football and it was fine. So I think when it all started draining away, um, not just in their school, but in general, I got really passionate. And um, so I'm on the board of trustees of several music charities, um, Music in Secondary Schools Trust, Music Masters. Um, I'm on the board of NCO as well, National Children's Orchestra. Um, and... Um, the Royal Liverpool um, Philharmonic Orchestra and all these music organisations, um, Nottingham Education Trust, because I just want to make sure that children have somewhere to go, that someone is banging the drum for music, um, because it can't just be my children that get into the world of music. There's so much pressure against children being able to succeed. So I do a lot of work for charities and, and I go around talking about it a lot <laughs> as well. Yeah, no, and I, I think that, it, I mean, having been a lecturer of English, it really it comes through in the book, right? I mean, it's it's just wonderfully written and uh, just captures things. So, I mean, even if you didn't pursue that particular career, the language certainly, you know, comes to life very much. Uh, in And it also in, in the speaking that I'm, you're doing, no doubt. Thank you. Yeah, and I think um, that's what I always think, that education is never wasted. So when parents come to me and say well my children want to learn music but they don't want to be musicians so what's the point and I always say that's something that they will never lose it's something that you keep for life and it's always there always inspiring you so I think um, any education is wonderful and and I obviously have a huge passion for the creative arts and I think if all children have access to that it's a jewel for the rest of your life. How, you mentioned that you learned the violin yourself as an adult. So what, what are your observations on that must be quite tough, right? To, um, but it, do, do you think there are benefits from, from that that even that adults can gain? Yeah, absolutely. It was so interesting. I thought I knew all about learning instruments because I had learned the piano and the cello as a child. And so I would just learn the violin because that's what I'd always wanted to do. And what it reminds you, um, which is, was very useful when I was watching the children, is just how physical learning to play an instrument is, how you have to 
relearn and, and train your muscles in very interesting ways, um, what that process of not being good at the beginning is like. And um, just that, I mean, I remember I used to play the violin, I used to practice for five minutes and then think, oh, that actually hurts. <laughs> and I think it made me a lot more patient with the children. And it made me understand what that process of learning is and just how exciting it is as well. And when you can actually play something, that joy is incredible. So it gave me a real insight, even though I'd already been through it as a child. It's quite different when you go back and think about it again. Also quite a powerful thing to do for your children, isn't it? To show that actually you, one keeps learning, you know, it doesn't matter how old one is. Exactly. And they used to look at me with fascination <laughs> as I'd be there working hard. But I always think you have to demonstrate if you want your children to do something, it doesn't mean you have to pick up an instrument. But if you are also working hard and doing things and demonstrating that, I think it's, it's a really good push for them as well. Yeah. So, I mean, as well as being musicians, I mean, the, your uh, young people and children are, are actually celebrities as well in many respects. I mean, you, you're, they're very much in the public eye. Um, and I, I, I must say, I, I, uh, maybe you should say the story of having the BBC crew to, to your house, which kind of gives a, um, a sense of the pressures that being in the public eye can be, but, uh, but also then on a sustained basis, um, how is that? It was really interesting because I brought all the children up. We were such a close unit and, you know, quite private because they'd come home from school. We'd all be together. We had a really sort of um, close family life. And then suddenly you have people breaking into that and observing. And that is a real step change. So we had to get used to being observed and people coming in and watching us. And, and But what we did, I think, was... Now we sort of separate all of that from this. So nothing's changed within the family. And then if they go out to a concert or whatever it is, that's, we see that as a very separate thing. During COVID, when we had the remote cameras all around the house, we kept forgetting they were there, <laughs> which is it's good and bad. <laughs> but, yes, I mean, people say, how do they handle it? And I think actually, because they can go back and forth. They can come into the family life, be with their brothers and sisters. Uh, a lot of them now are living or studying in London, but they're all sort of together. So they have a very close um, family bond and friends. And within that circle, there is no sense of celebrity or anything like that. And so there's, it's very grounding. There's mm. no way one of them could come strutting into the house with airs and graces, because they would just be laughed at. I think it's very, very good, actually. <laughs> Um, and so, I mean, social media is very much a part of of uh, being as uh, you know being in the public eye. I, I mean, well, e or even not. Um, but and it seems I think you talk in the book about kind of using social media as a way of kind of accessing more audiences. But it it also has a flip side, a darker side, doesn't it? Yeah. And I find social media really difficult. Um, a lot of the time, um, we're all a bit like that. We always think, well. Why do people want to see things we're doing behind the scenes? Because that's behind the scenes. So we have quite a strong sense of private life, actually. And that's quite difficult. And I think it's because when I brought them up, especially the older ones, they didn't have that. And they didn't have all the phones and they didn't have, there was no Instagram. And they had, when I look back, I think they had quite innocent childhoods, really. And um, you talk about how difficult it is for parents, I think it's more difficult now than it was when my older children were, were younger because I didn't have to deal with um, TikTok and um, bullying online or anything like that. It was really peaceful. You came home and you were home and the doors were shut. And I think people need to have that still in their lives if they're going to survive. Because if you're constantly taking photos of yourself and making everything public is actually psychologically damaging. You have to have breaks from that. So I think we're very good at doing that, actually. And how do you manage with the, the younger uh, uh, children then where yeah. they, wouldn't ha they, they do have access to all of that stuff? I think it was more of a challenge. And particularly, actually, 
after the lockdown, when they went back to school, they found it really difficult because all their friends had been basically living off social media the whole time because they were locked in their homes. And, and they felt in quite a lot of ways cut off from it. I won't let my younger daughter have TikTok and things like that because there's so much distracting stuff on that. But it didn't help her to escape it because then she'd go into school and she didn't know what her friends were looking at and there'd be all sorts of chatting online and some of it was bullying about her. Um, so you don't escape it. Um, so there was a lot of renegotiation, I think, when they went back to school of this world, which is actually a very hard world. It's very hard for girls. And I think it's very hard for boys as well, actually. So there's a constant need to, I think it's, it's much harder these days, actually. Hmm. How, because, uh, I mean, you've, t you've talked about your own determination and and the resilience of the of the kids as well and the things they've experienced. But on this topic, I think a, a lot of parents are feeling totally at sea on how to, you know, you just want to wrap your kids up in cotton wool, <laughs> you know, and, and it's it's very, it can be very damaging. So any any. I don't know tips or or reflections on on what can help and, and and how to manage when things get very difficult. Lots and lots of communication and talking, but I found the music did help because I think if your child has a structure to their day, and music gives that structure. So um, there was definitely there are no phones or social media or anything in the evenings if they're practicing. Um, I found uh, my youngest one kept going up to her room to do homework. And I thought, what does that mean, shutting the door? So I'm always very careful to constantly go in and then she's allowed a certain amount of time for homework. And then she has to come into the family home to practice. Um, and I listen and, you know, and that to her is a, is a very public joining in thing to do. Um, and I think music is very good in that way. And also um, we always had this thing when they grew up or we still have it um, when they come home and that's the Sunday afternoon concert when each of them has to play a piece, even if it's a work in progress, to the whole family and each sibling gets a chance to respond. And I thought that was an actual brilliant way of saying, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to communicate with you and we're all going to share what we're doing. And it means that when it comes to Sunday, I have to have something that I've done to share with you. And I found that really helpful and still very helpful. It's a wonderful, um, wonderful way of, of bringing the family together, but also creating this sense of um, expressing oneself um, and um, it being in dialogue about that expression. But the children always say that um, they would rather do a concert in the Albert Hall than play in front of these concerts because they know they're going to get absolute honesty and it's, it, they actually get quite nervous. It's quite interesting, but they're always really happy afterwards. <laughs> wow, a masterclass within the within the. <laughs> yeah. So, what, what plans actually does the? Um, oh, a question is: Will you be performing on Christmas Day again? Um, I don't know. I don't know. They're all they're all going to be home at Christmas as usual. So it's going to be a big family Christmas. Maybe not Christmas Day itself. Maybe before or after because um, this is a really busy term for everyone. Um, Sheikh is off on a US tour now. Jennifer is off on a European tour soon. They're all playing everywhere. And I think they see Christmas Day as, ah, oh, shut the door. <laughs> yeah, even, uh, even musicians must have rest time. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and indeed, I, I did want to ask for, for those of us who may wish to come and, you know, find these uh, performances and, uh, and what's, you know, be able to enjoy the, um, the Can of Masons performing. What, can you, any, uh, any events that we should keep an eye out for? Oh, goodness. Um, the best way to find out is to go on um, the Can A Mason website, which is canamasons.com. Um, Sheku's also got his own official website. You just Google Sheku Kane Mason. Isis has got her own official website. And then there's a Kane Mason website. Um, and of course, um, Twitter and Instagram and all of that. But if you want to know about concerts, they're all listed on the websites. Yeah, there's so much coming on that I can't, yeah, <laughs> keep it in my head.
do they do does does fatigue set in after a while with this this is quite a de- quite demanding schedules then that uh, that they have those who are in the you know soloist on the soloist circuit as we say yes and i think people think being a classical music, musician is quite glamorous but actually it is incredibly hard there's a lot of travel involved um dealing with trains and airplanes and airports and um and the practicalities as well of your carrying your cello or your luggage and you've got to get your clothes dry cleaned and and all of that i mean and the, the rehearsals and the practice and um it's all very challenging but they all say they wouldn't do anything else it's absolutely what they live for so and i think um just being in that moment and um performing to people on stage you have to love doing that you have to get there's so much energy that comes from that that all the rest then is made up for i think but yes it is very challenging and and i would guess also you know injury yeah, is can be something that's quite a can be a concern right if you're carrying heavy things and your your precious wrists um can get fatigued probably too. And even just practice. And I think um, what they have learned the hard way, some of them, is how to avoid in- injury. Um, it's it's like being an athlete. If you're not very careful, if you're not doing the right stretching, if you're not relieving tension and making sure there's no tension when you practice, you risk injury. And they have friends who can no longer play because they are so injured, their bodies can no longer do it. Um, and one of them had a teacher actually who was teaching piano because they couldn't play anymore because of an injury. So they are very aware of that. And they've had to have um, professional advice in some cases. Um, but I think learning how to manage it, and there should be more teaching about that from lower down, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's the, the kids, what, what they're going to do next, we'll find out on the website. What about yourself? What do you have? What what are you, what are, what are the, is the next kind of dream and vision to be realised for you personally? Well, at the moment, I'm going around talking a lot. Um, I am going to pre- present the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra Christmas concerts, which will be lots of fun. Um, and then I'd like to start doing writing again because I found I wrote House of Music and thought, oh, I'll carry on writing. And then lockdown happened, and I had a there were 10 of us in the house for five and a half months and it was just mayhem and um, I didn't have any time to write. And I think since then, um, I need to now get back to that. I think finding some quiet time. Uh, and what, any, uh, what, what are the kind of topics that are floating in your mind about that you might um, write about? Some are non-fiction, um, uh, writing about, I suppose, the themes that come out of House of Music and writing about those um and another might be fiction so we'll see what happens <laughs> very exciting well we shall uh, we shall wait uh, with pleasure another uh, uh, another wonderful uh, gift from the from um from your writing mind um <laughs> somebody's asked a very practical question which is how big is your house I th- ah. do describe practice time actually in terms of how that how that works yeah, so what we did is we bought a very old, quite run-down house because we thought space was the most important thing. So it is, um, the rooms are quite big um, and it has six bedrooms and um, it's, I mean, it's it's a mess <laughs> and very old and the windows are all falling out and things like that and it's very cold, but it does have space. And I think if you've got seven children racing around, that's actually quite useful. We have four pianos, so there are two pianos in here, one here and one over there, um, because they like to practice concertos with each other or duets. And um, the other two pianos are in two different, one's in the hall actually, in the hallway, and one's in another room. Um, And so there are rooms, they they share bedrooms, but there's always some space that they can practice. They can use to practice in the bathroom, and there are lots of holes in the floor from his spike still. <laughs> so. Indeed, our, our, in the book, I think you say, because the sound is actually best in the bathroom, which is funny. <laughs> so we had to stop that because it's a bit like playing in a cathedral. Bathrooms are wonderful places, but they don't help you to refine your sound. Practice in the deadest room with the most carpet possible. 
There's a, there's a thought to leave us with. Well, Caddy, thank you so much for, for this evening. It's really been illuminating. Um, Caddy's book, House of Music, um, is available from Greaves Bookstore in, in Berwick, but also, but, and in any good uh, book, bookshop. Um, Berwick uh, Literary Festival and Music Series are voluntary charities. So if you enjoyed uh, the conversation today, could you please uh, feel free to make a, a donation? That would be very much uh, much appreciated. And do feel free to uh, to tweet uh, and and uh, promote the uh, the uh, the series on uh, on social media. Um, lots more events over the rest of the the weekend. Um, but in the meantime, I'll wish you um, a very good Friday evening. And thank you again to you, Caddy. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.